chapter 3. <clears throat> Let's open in a word of prayer to the Father. Father, we thank you for the time we the time that you give us to congregate, to assemble uh, as, as individual members of the church. Thank you for the word of God that you've preserved, that we have in our laps. Father, I pray as, uh, as the days do grow dim that we keep a joy about us, a Christian joy, a joy that's born through the filling of the Holy Spirit, a joy and rejoicing heart, the, the same heart that Paul had that he wrote to the Philippians, even while he's inside a Roman jail. Paul utters the words, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Father, we thank you for uh, this word. We thank you for Galatians. We thank you for Paul. Uh, we thank you for his commitment to you and his willingness to be beheaded by Nero. That he, as Martin Luther did, was in a fortress whose bulwarks couldn't fail. And though Satan buffeted and buffeted and buffeted, Paul wouldn't break. As even Felix tried to hold out for two years with Paul in a Roman jail, Felix tried to hold out thinking that eventually Paul would crack and come to him trying to buy his way out of jail, but not Paul. So we thank you for the man that you had write this epistle to the Galatians, this letter of warning, of dire consequence to them as they were dabbling in the occult, as it were. They were dabbling in false gospel, the doctrines of demons. And Paul was prepared. And Paul walked into Galatia, gave them the Lord Jesus Christ, and they believed. And yet, very soon afterwards, the false teachers, Satan's people, followed suit and tried to destroy the church of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So we pray for this session this morning as we look uh, on the ground 2,000 years ago in the cities of Galatia. Please guide us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we just started Galatians chapter 3, and Galatians chapter 2 verse 21 can be paraphrased this way. I'm sorry, Galatians 3 verse 1 can be paraphrased this way. Listen to the personalness in the question Paul asks. Who, Galatians? Who? Who's the man? Who's the person? Who's this? Who are these false teachers? Who could have succeeded in bringing you under the spell of an evil eye? They didn't have a satanic cast, a spell cast on them, but it is, it's as if they were under a trance that someone came in there and cast a spell on them, an evil eye spell. Who could have done this to you when directly before your eyes stood revealed the crucified Christ? Uh, personal. You're either going to believe that God sent teachers... And this is the choice of the Galatian believers and the choice of every Christian, even today. There are God-sent teachers and there are Satan-sent deceivers. They're all over the television. They're all over everywhere. They're in big churches. I assure you today on the earth, Satan has many, many, many more churches than Jesus Christ does. Many, many, many more churches convened this morning being deceived by Satan than are opening the Word of God to be taught by God the Holy Spirit. So as we start into this, 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 this new chapter, um, I want to I remind you of who this audience is in Galatia. I said a couple of words about Paul in the prayer. Very quickly, I just want you to remember, it's been a while since we've been in Galatians chapter 1, but this is what the story is historically, the backdrop. Uh, Galatians 1 verse 2 says, To the churches of Galatia. So he's talking to multiple churches. This isn't like to the Ephesian churches or to the Philippian church. This is to... Uh, or the Ephesian church, there was one church, one church in Philippi. There were multiple churches in the region of Galatia. Look at the map here. You know that Paul took several missionaries, missionary journeys. He took several long trips, 
spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the known world at that time. And the first trip that he took, it's called his missionary journey because he went out on a mission of Jesus Christ, a sent one to proclaim and preach that Jesus Christ indeed, Jesus of Nazareth was Messiah, is Messiah, was crucified for the sins of man and rose on the third day. Many times Paul will say, I'm being persecuted for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was his mission. And you'll see right in the middle of the screen in the green that it says Galatia, Galatia. And you see these four churches. Now we only have four listed there because in the book book of Acts, those are the ones that are named. Could there be more churches? I suppose there could be. What are the churches that we know of? Those four. So Paul is writing this letter to believers that he met in person along his journeys. People that became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ because of Paul's uh, proclamations to them about this Jesus of Nazareth. They hadn't heard yet. Paul took them the news. Paul took them the news. So he's writing to believers in Jesus Christ who make up the church. Of course, you have to be a believer in Jesus Christ to be a member of the church, the body of Christ. Paul is writing... It's important that you know who he's writing to. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians, people who have placed their faith only, not their works, their faith only in Jesus Christ only. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who were first called Christ ones at Antioch, Christians. He's writing to Christians, Christians, Christians. Uh, Again, I'm bringing this up because Paul speaks of God the Holy Spirit in in verse 2, and we're about to see this. And he's going to ask them a question, when did you receive God the Holy Spirit? Well, we need to know that he's talking to Christians. Not everybody in the world has God the Holy Spirit as their own possession. Paul's writing to Christians. It's an important thing to note. I'm certain there are heresies out there that believe the Holy that everybody has the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with Christianity and belief in Jesus the Messiah. But oh yes, it does. So only people who've placed their faith alone in Christ alone are Christians, and that's the audience that has God the Holy Spirit that Paul is about to map uh, speak to. So the churches, according to the map, are these. You see them, Pisidian Antioch, right there. Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Remember, it was at Lystra that Paul was stoned and cast outside the city, left for dead. Uh, so when you talk about what's going on in Galatia, when you talk about the persecutions, he's about to ask them. One of the questions he asked them was, all the persecution that you went through in vain? There was real persecution in these cities. Paul was stoned, presumably to death and cast outside the city of Lystra, one of the cities of Galatia. There's persecution in these lands. These are the people Paul's writing this letter to. So not only do they hate the Christians there and want to cast the Christians out of their cities, stone them, but the false teachers, Satan was right behind God. He's following Paul around. Make no mistake, Satan knows who Paul is. He knows exactly who Paul is. And he's following them around, bringing his deceivers into these church right after. Uh, what does he say? That savage wolves will come in after me? Well, of course they will, because Satan's going to send his deceivers in to try to distort, to pervert the word of God that Paul taught. You've got the God-sent messenger in Paul. You've got Satan's deceivers right on his heels. And these four churches in Galatia are falling for Satan's lies. Who, who could have cast you under this spell? It's personal. God sent me. I was stoned in one of your cities. I'll do anything for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know it, the crucified Messiah. Who have you let come in there and cast you under a spell as it were? Who are you listening to instead of me? Very, very personal to Paul. Paul works for Jesus Christ and his Father 
Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these false teachers, you're letting these false satanic doctrines of demons bearing teachers get into your heads? You're senseless. You're not thinking. That's why he calls them fools. You're not using reason. When Paul went through these towns, he taught a pure gospel. What is that gospel? Here are the questions. How is a man forgiven of his sins? What would someone sensitive to the things of God want to know from Paul in Lystra, in Derby, in Antioch, Pisidian Antioch? How do I get forgiven of my sins? What else? How, am I, how could I ever be declared righteous by God the Father? I list these things because if you don't have these three things, you don't get to heaven. So the question is, how is a Galatian forgiven of his sins? How is a Galatian man or woman declared righteous by God? Justified. That's what it means to be justified. That God the Father declares you righteous. How does that come about? How is a man in Galatia given eternal life? How is that man saved from hell? And Paul went in Pete preaching a pure gospel, very simple, faith only in Jesus Christ only. Faith not works. By faith in Jesus Christ, a man is forgiven of his sins. A man is declared righteous from the Father at the moment he places his faith in Jesus Christ. He's given eternal life. I hold him in the palm of my hand. No one can pluck them out of my palm. There's, neither, there, there's, now for, there's therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Eternal life, not temporary life. Eternal life, not life that can be lost because of your foolish sins. Galatians, Gulf Coast Bible Church, Rick King, can't be lost. And at the point of faith alone in Jesus Christ, a person, a Galatian, is transferred from death to life eternally, saved from hell, a citizen now of the streets of heaven. If we were in the Pentecostal church, I would hope that everybody's hands would be up saying, Amen, brother. But we're not. But that's amenable right there. That's amenable right there. Thank you. We'll li we, we will live eternally based on those simple statements. And Paul taught a pure gospel. This was Paul's focus, the man Jesus Christ, not dying on the cross, but having died on the cross, resurrected from the dead. But Paul's question to these people and to all the places he went, and especially the Galatians here, is Christ's death on the cross enough to satisfy God the Father so that the Father will justify you, declare you righteous, or do you have to add something also? That's the question. And when I say Satan has more churches today than Jesus does, what I mean by that is I, I guarantee you there are more churches teaching that bottom half, I have to add something, than there are teaching the top half, Jesus paid it all. When Jesus said to Telestai, it is finished. Father, every work you sent me to do, I have completed. The sins of mankind were poured out on me on this cross, and it's finished forever. It stands finished. He meant it. And there are more churches today right now convening that are saying the bottom part. You can add to it. You have to add to it. You have, to do, you have to be baptized, the Church of Christ. They're preaching this morning. I guarantee you they got more than 30 people in their churches this morning. And they are preaching that in order to be justified by the Father, you have to believe in Jesus Christ and be water baptized or no salvation for you. In the Catholic churches, and I assure you they've got more than 30 that that priest is leading that mass through. In the Catholic churches, they are teaching absolutely Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the crucified one. He was buried, resurrected on the third day. They're preaching every bit of that, but there's no period at the end of it. You have to work. You have to follow the seven sacraments of the church. 
You have to come and, 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 uh, and receive the wafer. You have to go through the miracle of the Mass. You have to crucify Jesus Christ over and over and over. That's what the, Christian, the Catholic Mass is. It's a re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ over and over. I could go to church after church after church, but that's not why we're here. We're Gulf Coast Bible Church. It doesn't matter what's happening outside our doors. What matters is happening inside our doors. What's happening inside here. We're preaching the purity of the gospel that Paul taught. Pure. Are you going to listen to Paul's teaching? Remember, Paul has gone through two chapters with the Galatians, proving to them that he is a God-sent apostle. You say, why Galatians 1 and 2? Two chapters uh, describing himself, defending his ability, his ministry as an apostle. Why? Because they were under assault from Satan's deceivers. It's personal. Are you going to believe me sent from God after everything I've taught you, how I met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, etc., etc.? Are you going to believe me? Or are you going to let Satan come in here and his deceivers cast a spell over you, like put blinders on you? Who could have done this to you after Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified in your eyes? It's personal to Paul. Very personal. So he asked the question in verse 2, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. I want you to consider this. I want you to put your thinking caps on, Galatians. He calls them foolish, which means you're not thinking, you're not reasonable. I'm asking you to, to think and be reasonable. I'm going to ask you some questions. This is what I want to know from you. You answer the questions, Galatians. So I would ask you, Gulf Coast Bible Church, you answer the questions. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? It's works or faith. All throughout Galatians, it's works or faith. It's works or faith. So Paul is asking, I want you to consider this. Now, I wrote it on the board, that thing on the bottom. Just act like you don't see it. Consider this, Galatians. Think with me. Reason with me. This, this is the, the, the progression. You're believers in Jesus Christ. I know it because I gave you Jesus Christ. I taught you Jesus Christ. I know you believe in Jesus Christ. So here's, here's the groundwork. You're believers in Jesus Christ, so you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside you. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit more in just a few minutes. The premise, you're believers, you have the Holy Spirit. The question, when did you receive the Holy Spirit? When did you receive the Holy Spirit of God? They must know the answer or he wouldn't ask the question. When Paul was there in these cities, he taught them these things. They know exactly what occurs at the point of salvation, that an unbeliever is ter turned from death to life. He's a new creation, the old man having been crucified with Christ on the cross. Still a sinner, no question, but a new creation in Christ Jesus. They, they receive the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them inside your body and my body right now lives God the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, when did he come in? When did you receive him? An active, verse, uh, an active, verb, uh, active voice verb, excuse me, an aorist active indicative, the active voice. It's something that they did. They didn't reach out and grab the Holy Spirit, but by their belief, by their hearing with faith, they chose to receive God the Holy Spirit. It's an active voice verb. If, if it was done to them, it would be passive. So here are the choices. Choice A, at the moment of hearing and believing in the gospel. That's what he calls faith, hearing with faith. Did you receive God the Holy Spirit at the split second you heard my message and you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior? You place your faith in Jesus Christ or there's an option, Galatians, the B option, or did you receive God the Holy Spirit after some amount of obeying the law? which is works. Good question, right? 
Thank goodness for the Bible. We read this and see Paul in a struggle with the Galatians, but we take a lot of theology from these verses. When does a Christian receive God the Holy Spirit? In verse 14, as you'll see down there on the bottom of this very same uh, chapter, he answers the question. So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. How do you get the Spirit of God? Not by working, but by faith. When you believed in Jesus Christ, when you heard the gospel of salvation, when you heard that you're a sinner and the Father had sent His Son to take your place on the cross, that that Son was crucified, that the sins of the world, including your sins, were poured out on Him, that He bore your sins in His own body on the tree. When you hear those truths, when you heard them from my mouth, a messenger of God, and you believed those words that God was faithful and, and saved you simply based on faith, that's when you received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. So that we would, we would receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of verses here concerning this promise of the Spirit. Uh, just think in your head. I'm not, don't, don't say it out loud. It's not a test. But just think in your head of the Scripture that you know. And when would the Holy Spirit of God have been promised to mankind. The promise of the Spirit. Was God the Holy Spirit promised to mankind? I hope something's coming up. The promise of the Spirit. The promised Spirit. Jesus Christ, on the night He was betrayed, the very night before He would be crucified the next morning at 9 a.m., was having a meal with His disciples. There were 12 in the room. Uh, Judas had already left the room by now. There are 11 men in the room, 11 disciples plus Jesus, the Savior of the world. And Jesus says these things to these men. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper. That word helper in the Greek is parakletos, uh, the helper, a name, for Je uh, a name for God, the Holy Spirit. And He tells us who the helper is here. We don't have to guess. Where do we get the, the helper? The Father sends the helper because Jesus will ask the Father to send the helper. By the way, do you see the Trinity in the Bible? Is God a Trinity? Oh, God doesn't exist. The Mormons come to your door. Jehovah's Witness come to your door. Satan has more churches working today than Jesus Christ does. They're out on the streets. They're in your towns. They're at your doorsteps saying this isn't true. It's right there in the Scriptures for all the world to see. The Father, he will, give, he will give you another Helper, the Spirit. Jesus is the I, the Spirit, the Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in one verse. I will ask the Father, He'll give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. Who is He, Lord? The Spirit of truth. God the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive. See, I started by saying not everybody in the world has God the Holy Spirit. Not everybody in the world receives God the Holy Spirit because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. So Jesus is teaching these men certain things and we get deep theology. Not only does Jesus promise that when He goes away, the, the, these disciples don't know that Jesus will be crucified the next day. But when He is crucified, and when He finally is resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father, what happened in heaven is the, Father asked the, the Son asked the Father, and the Father sent the Spirit to earth on the day of Pentecost, the day the church began in Acts chapter 2. None of this is spooky. The Holy Spirit is in some, ah, oh, He's eternal God. He's eternal God. He has all the attributes of, of the Father, all the attributes of the Son. He isn't some mystical, weird power force that moves men. He's God. And Jesus promised Him to us. That's why He's called the promised Spirit. He will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world can't see Him because it doesn't know Him or see Him, but you will know Him. But you know Him because He abides with you. Old Testament truth. Remember that until the day of Pentecost, we are in the Jewish age. 
not the church age. Jesus is speaking in John chapter 14, living in the Jewish age. And in the Jewish age, God the Holy Spirit didn't live inside anyone. But after I'm resurrected and 50 days go by, the Holy Spirit will come to earth and He will, he will indwell you. He will be, future tense, He will be in you, uh, as it were, from this day forward, 53 days later. What else does Jesus say in that upper room a little further concerning the Helper, the Parakletos, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, Make no mistake, oh Rick, it says the Spirit of truth. How do we know that's God the Holy Spirit? Well, he keeps on going. He knows that Satan's going to send in his men to start deceiving and perverting the Word. So he's just a sh sharper and sharper point on the pencil. Keep sharpening the pencil until it's just a, a, a dagger that could enter. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... The Father will send in my name because I asked the Father to send Him. That's my promise to you, disciples. That's my promise to you, the church. That Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will teach you all things. That's why I pray, Father, have, let the Holy Spirit teach us today. That's not mystical. That's not magic. It's the Bible. He's God and He's the teacher. Jesus is the Savior. The Father's the planner. They all three are creator. He teaches us. And He brings to your remembrance all that I said to you. So those, those things, I've said this before, sometimes you're in conversation with someone and you're, you're, you're trying to be God's servant, God's messenger, and all of a sudden a verse will come out of your mouth. This isn't magic. This isn't mystical. This isn't the liver quiver. But all of a sudden a verse will come out of your mouth and you'll think, boy, I haven't thought of that in ages. Because God the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. It refers to all of the Scripture, all of the teachings of Jesus, not just on this night. That's part of the work of this promised Spirit. John 16, continuing in the upper room later that night. Remember, John 13 to 16 is one conversation. It's one evening. It's a meal. It's one evening. Jesus says this, but now I am going. They don't know where He's going. Remember, you're all sorrowful because you don't know where I'm going. Uh, Lord, how can, we know where you're, how, how can we know the way we don't know where you're going? When He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. They don't know that He's going to be crucified the next day. They think they're celebrating the Passover as good, obedient Jews. Jesus is saying things they won't understand for three days. Three days from this day, when Jesus appears to them, the light bulbs start going off. I'm going to Him who sent me. Again, the Trinity. I'm going to Him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They don't want their Messiah to leave. He'd been with them for three and a half years, and now He says He's leaving. But I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. How many times have you said, Lord, if you'd only show yourself to me, if you'd only walk with me, if only Jesus could walk with me like he walked with the disciples, if only I lived in the days of Jesus, the Christian life would be easier. I'd have a mentor, I'd have a guide on the ground. And Jesus says, no, it's advantageous if I leave. The Christian says, but I don't want, I want if, if only God would be here, I could be a more obedient Christian. Jesus blows that right out of the water, doesn't He? It's to your advantage that I go. The plan of the Father is that you live the Christian life by means of God the Holy Spirit. It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper, the Parakletos, who is the Helper? The Holy Spirit. If I don't go away, the Spirit isn't coming. If I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, and I am tomorrow, I'll send Him to you. Fascinating, fascinating how often we would, if only God, you could be here with me. And the Lord says, I'm here, here, I'm here. I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness in this book. How, did you open the book? Have you read the book for yourself? Do you know what's in here? I'm all over here. 
So Jesus is the promiser of the Holy Spirit to come that Paul refers to here. We receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of faith. The promised Holy Spirit, the one who Jesus promised us just recently. Notice also that he says that he would send God the Holy Spirit, we, we saw from John 14, 16, to not only be with the disciples, the Christians that would become Christians soon, but he would be in the Christian. The God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't exist beside, as he did in the Old Testament, uh, come alongside helper. He's an internal helper of the church. This is one of the great distinctions between the church and Israel between the church age and the age we came out of, the the age of Israel, that God the Holy Spirit lives inside the Christian. Even the night that He's speaking to them, God the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside these men. He will come to live inside these men. A church age distinctive, uh, a truth that's only true Uh, so far of this age in which we live. No other dispensation. Adam didn't have God the Holy Spirit living in him. He didn't have the Spirit of God living in him. Even when he was in innocence, when he was perfect, God the Holy Spirit didn't live inside Adam. When Adam fell, God the Holy Spirit didn't live inside him in the age of conscience, when Adam knew right from wrong. Uh, And when the church or when the Jewish age began, God the Holy Spirit didn't live inside those people. God the Holy Spirit didn't live inside Moses or Aaron or Joshua or the great kings, David, Hezekiah, Josiah. He didn't live inside those men. But he was with David because in Psalm 51, David prays to God, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He was with David. He was David's helper. Parakletos, not a bad word. He was David's strength. David's bulwark, David's rock, David's high tower. But he didn't live inside David. And we, here we are sitting, we're no kings. We're no princes of people. We're just ordinary folks, ordinary Christians trying to do the work of the Lord, trying to please Him in our daily lives. And yet we have something that the king of Israel didn't have. The one that God said, this is a man after my own heart. We outrank David spiritually. We have things that man didn't have. Astounding truth. My question has to uh, go to this. Peter or Paul is asking these questions. When did you receive the Holy Spirit of God? When you believed in God, when you believed in Christ, or after some second blessing, after some amount of work that you did, did you earn the Holy Spirit? Is his question, or was it a free gift from God? The answer, of course, is it was a free gift. But my question is, did it really happen? Jesus promises that the helper will come, the Parakletos, the Spirit of God, uh, or the, the Spirit of Truth. God the Holy Spirit, we have to go to the Scriptures to see if it happened. Just because it's, it promised, He promised it doesn't mean it really came to pass. But of course we know that it did. Paul writes, the same Paul that's writing to the Galatians here, writes this fact to the Corinthian church. Or do you not know that your body, I'm in 1 Corinthians six nineteen. or do you not know, Christians... Again, Christians in Corinth. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? What did Jesus say? He's with you and He will be, future tense promise, He will be in you. Paul says He's here. The Holy Spirit of God resides, lives, dwells inside each of us the way that God dwelled inside the Jewish temple. Where did we get the Holy Spirit? He's a gift from God. And that you are not your own. Again, the Trinity, at least two parts right here. If you go on to the next part, uh, the next verse, you'll pick up the Son. You're not your own. You've been bought with the price. Who is the price payer? Jesus Christ on the cross. The Trinity's all over the Scripture, all over it. But what's happening here is we can see, we have to be careful here, I will say this about this word temple. Uh, be careful not to, uh, not to overplay the analogy here. 
Uh, we are not um, worship centers. The temple in the Old Testament was the Jewish worship center. Well, our individual bodies are not worship centers. The analogy that's being played here is the fact that God dwelt in the temple. And He dwells in us now. We are the dwelling place of God on earth. Where once upon a time in the temple in Jerusalem, you'd look out in Jerusalem, and from the Holy of Holies, you could see the smoke rising, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of smoke. That's the presence, the Shekinah glory. That's the presence of God. There is no temple on earth. There is no Mosaic law that's being kept. We are now, each of us individually, are the dwelling places of God. Now think about that just for a minute. You know what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Sexual immorality. You think, why would Paul bring this up here? There's sexual immorality going on in the church where there's a man who's taken his father's wife for his own. You follow that? A man has taken his father's wife. It wouldn't be his mother. Maybe his mother died. He married somebody else. Who knows? But his father's wife... The son of that man is taken as his own. What Paul is telling them is, don't you know that when you go into that room with that woman, you are taking God with you? When you defile yourself, you're not defiling just yourself. You are, bringing, you are inviting God, Creator God, into that room of depravity. That's why it comes up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Bought and paid for with the price. Live as if you know that, he tells that Corinthian church because of that sin. So Paul is going to start to ask questions of these people. When did you receive the Spirit of God? Uh, and he'll ask from verse, five, from verse 3 to verse 5, he asks more questions. But he's asking the Galatians here, when the, the, the question in this verse is, when were you given the Holy Spirit? And look at how he answers this in Ephesians chapter 1. So he doesn't answer it here. He assumes that they know, and he assumes that we know. If we only had, if we were in a prison, and we found a little fragment of the Bible, and it was Galatians 2 and Galatians 3... If that's all we had, those two crumpled up pages, and we didn't have the rest of the book, we wouldn't know. We would only know that Paul made the assumption that the Galatians received the Holy Spirit at the moment they were believers, at the moment of belief. But we have the whole Bible. Praise God, we have the whole book. Look at how Paul answers this question to the church in Ephesians. What's the question? When did you receive the Holy Spirit? Again, look for the Trinity. Maybe you'll find him in this verse. because and This is just crazy. This is the fourth verse today where the Trinity is in one verse. In Him you also... Who's the Him? Christ, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. In Him you also, after... Now look at the progression here. After listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. What do you have to know before you can believe? you got to know the story of Jesus. What did He do? Who is He? Why did He come? What did He do for me? They knew this. After listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed it, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The promised Holy Spirit. Who promised Him? Jesus did. Having also believed, at the moment you believed, you were sealed in Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Who's God? He's the Father. So who do you have there? In Him, Jesus Christ. In the middle of the verse, when we believed in Jesus Christ, we were sealed with God the Holy Spirit. There's the third person of the Trinity and at the end of it, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, there's the first person of the Trinity. The Trinity's all over this book. Don't let those people that knock on your door uh, make you question, well, I don't know, is it really there? 
Have I just believed what the pastor said all these years? No, it's all over the book. I want to I give you a couple of words out of this, a couple of Greek words from this. Sealed. We were sealed in Him. What does that mean? And also it says that the Holy Spirit was given to the believer as a pledge of our inheritance. Very quickly, I want to go over these and we're going to close. The word for seal is the Greek word sphragizo, sphragizo, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-Z-O. I bring up that word because some of these words have a much deeper meaning than they do in the, in the English translation. This word sphragizo means to, to make secure. Uh, imagine them sealing the tomb of Jesus Christ so he couldn't get out and nobody could get in. To make something secure or to mark with a seal as a means of identification. Uh, think of a brand on a cow. Uh, the Old Testament would use the word sfragizo for how we brand a cow with a branding iron. It's a mark. It's a seal of identification. That cow belongs to that, that rancher. So it indicates, I'm going to give you some other words. What does sealing us indicate? When the Father sealed us with the Holy Spirit, uh, I just want to branch out a little bit. What does it indicate? It indicates that we're secure. That we're secure in Christ. It indicates that we are authenticated. We're authentic Christians, Christ ones. He has sealed us. We now belong to God and to His Son, Jesus Christ. We, we are not our own. We were bought and paid for with the price. It, identi it, it uh, indicates approval. He wouldn't seal something as His own if He didn't approve of it. It indicates genuineness. And of course, identification of ownership. We're His. We're sealed with God the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And the second word is this word, arabon. A-R-R-A-B-O-N, arabon is the Greek word that this translator translated pledge. Terrible translation, terrible. Especially now because none of us know what a pledge is. This is what it is. It's a down payment. We understand down payment language because all of us have bought a car on time. A partial payment made at the time of purchase with the balance to be paid later. That's what a pledge is. So when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father gave us God the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit living, on, living in us is a down payment of the surety that we will one day be resurrected to glory. Live in an imperishable, incorruptible, immortal, resurrected body. The down payment, the promise, the pledge, the partial payment was the fact that He offered God the Holy Spirit to come into us, to indwell us permanently. Remember, He says He'll be with you forever. It's a down payment. It's a pledge toward our inheritance. What's the inheritance? It's that glorification at the rapture of the church or, or at our death, that, that taking on of a new glorified human body. No, not at our death, at the rapture of the church. That's when the church, every member of the church, dead or those still living, receive their resurrection body. One verse. It's 1201. Take a deep breath. We're there. Oh, again, the salvation, uh, the Trinity in one verse. Astounding. I gave you five today. God, the Holy Spirit gave them to you because I didn't track that. Five of them today. No Trinity. Heresy. 2 Corinthians 1.21 Now He who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God. He who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God. You've got the Son of God, Christ. You've got God the Father, God here. He who established us, who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us. Sfragizo. 
He sealed us and He gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as a promise, as a promise. In Ephesians 4, verse 30, just write this verse down. Ephesians 4, verse 30 says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed, period. No, it doesn't, there's no period there. Not there. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What's the seal for? What's the pledge? What's the down payment? What's the continued, the fulfillment of the payments? What do we have to look forward to? If the Holy Spirit is a down payment in my life as a mortal human, when is the payout and what does the complete payment look like? You are going to look at this man one day in a glorified body and I'm going to look out on you in glorified human bodies. That's the completion of the payment. The down payment that God the Holy Spirit will live in your mortal bodies. The completion of the payment, He'll continue living in your bodies when I resurrect you to glory. The way I resurrected my son and called him out of the tomb, I will one day come for you. I'll send my son to resurrect you, call you out of the tombs. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and there we shall be with Christ forever. What's your future? I don't know what your future is this afternoon or tomorrow or the next day. I don't know what trials the Lord will bring into your life. I don't know what stresses in your household, in your family, with your spouses, with your kids. I don't know all those things, but I know they're coming. And I know they're probably there now for most of you. The stresses of a nation in decline, a distressed nation a distressed White House, impending Marxism. The slow, the, it used to be a slow march of socialism, and now they're running as if they're attacking like an army that's affixed bayonets and they're charging. That's where we're at. But what's our future? I mean our future, our end. Glorification, resurrection, eternal immortality, Eternal imperishableness. When you don't wake up and your knee hurts or your back hurts or your teeth hurt or you don't wake up to any of that. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. The old things are passed away. The scripture says momentary light affliction in comparison, for, in comparison with the weight of glory that we will all have. Momentary light affliction. Uh, I say and you say I'm sure it's not momentary or light. Well, don't hear Rick King say it to you. Hear God the Holy Spirit say it to you through the writer of Hebrews. It is both momentary, it's temporary, and it is also light. When you weigh it in the balance of who you will be in Jesus Christ one day soon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you give us to look into your word. Thank you for teaching us so much theology. Even, even though this was a letter, we pick it apart and we see so many truths about who we are, uh, how God the Holy Spirit lives in us, and all those facts that, that He's a guarantee from you that one day you will resurrect us. That's the language. We, we, just, we bow our knees in, in, in humble service to you, in humility, uh, in dependence, we need you, Father, in our every, with every breath we take, we rely on you. But how often do we thank you for the next breath we take? I just pray that you would open our eyes to the truth, each of us, all of us. Open each of our eyes to the truth of what we're doing down here. And that we would seek to please you in our every thought, our every dirt, our, our every word, our every action, that our goal would be to be pleasing to you who did everything for us even sealed us until the day when you redeem us. Father, thank you for all these things, these truths in Jesus' name. Amen.